This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. The Biden administration imposed sanctions last week on three Israeli settlers and two Israeli outposts in the occupied West Bank over their involvement with assaulting, harassing and threatening Palestinians, violently expelling many from their land. The U.S. State Department sanctions target Moshe Sharvit, the owner of Moshe's farm outposts, Zvi Bar Yosef, founder of Zvi's farm, and Nedia Ben Pazi. Over the past five months, Israeli settler violence has intensified across the West Bank, with human rights groups accusing the Israeli government of encouraging attacks against Palestinians. According to health officials, well over 400 Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank by Israeli forces and settlers since October 7th. Investigative journalist Shane Bauer recently wrote a piece for The New Yorker magazine, which features two of the Israeli settlers sanctioned by the Biden administration, Nedia Benpazi and Moshe Sharvit, whom Bauer described as two very dangerous men. Shane Bauer traveled to their illegal outposts in the West Bank and spoke to several other settlers mapping out the violence against Palestinians that's escalated since October 7th. His piece for The New Yorker was published in February. It's titled, The Israeli Settlers Attacking Their Palestinian Neighbors. The print edition calls it The Dispossessed. I recently interviewed Shane Bauer and began by asking him about his journey to the West Bank and how he came to meet the settlers who were eventually sanctioned by the Biden administration. October 7th came sort of in the middle of an unprecedented wave of settler violence in the West Bank, starting around the beginning of uh, 2023. Um, this uh, sort of uptick in violence came after the, you know, new government came to power in Israel, which included some very powerful settlers, like Itamar Ben-Gavir and Bezalel Smotrich. Um, before October 7th, the U.N. was recording about three settler attacks a day. Of course, October 7th comes, and the violence increased exponentially. Um, I was seeing, just days after October 7th, reports from Israeli and Palestinian human rights groups about attacks and some villages that were being uh, depopulated. So I traveled to the West Bank. Um, while I was there, I met uh, two of the settlers who were just sanctioned, um, Moshe Sharvit and Neria Bembazi. These are guys who uh, run farms, they're shepherding farms, and this is a fairly new type of tactic uh, used to seize land by, the, by settlers uh, in the West Bank. Essentially, there are settlers that are setting up outposts. These are, you know, illegal under Israeli law, not only international law, which considers all settlements illegal, but even Israel considers these outposts illegal. However, Israel has, uh, as Moshe's wife, Moria, told me uh, Israel was supporting them in setting up the outpost. They consulted with many branches of government. Um, they got support from the army. Um, this, this outpost that I went to was sort of a small farm where they, they have a bunch of sheep. And the idea of these kind of shepherding outposts is that uh, the settlers with, re with relatively small number of people can control a large area of land. What they do is they go out and graze their sheep and forcibly push out any Palestinians that are in that territory. So they're kind of part of a strategy which is uh, to sort of clear the part of the West Bank known as Area C. This is uh, the 60 percent of the West Bank that is essentially under Israeli control, to keep it clear of Palestinians uh, in the hopes of an eventual annexation to Israel. I want to interrupt um, for a second, are... Shane, because mm -hmm. when you talk about Area C, I don't think most people yeah. understand the divisions, Area A, Area yeah. B, and Area C, if you can explain. Right. Sure. So in the Oslo Accords of the 1990s, uh, the West Bank was basically divided into three zones. Area A would be under the contr full control of the Palestinian Authority. That included the major cities like Ramallah and Nablus. And Area B was mostly the Palestinian villages. And there, Israel would have security control and the Palestinian Authority would have administrative control. The rest of the territory is Area C, where Israel would have full military security control and administrative control. 
So what you have, if you look at the map of these areas, you essentially have uh, hundreds of, of islands of area A and B that are sort of in a sea of area C. And so if you imagine the annexation of area C, what it would look like is the creation of many small enclaves, Palestinian enclaves, sort of like creating numerous Gaza Strips within the West Bank or uh, Bantustans in the you know, South African uh, apartheid model. Um, these areas where would have you know, Palestinians living in them, but uh, according to the plan of Bezalel Smotrich, who is, uh, has, is in charge, essentially, of the West Bank, uh, Palestinians living there would not have voting rights. So there's a sort of been an ongoing campaign by settlers to uh, sort of claim Area C for Israel. It's 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 over since the 90s been treated more and more by Israel as uh, sort of a part of Israel. Um, but there's a push to make it, you know, more official. And Smotrich has come out with a plan uh, years ago. Uh, which essentially says that, you know, he wants to annex uh, the West Bank. P Palestinians who, who don't like this can either leave or stay as non-voting citizens, which, you know, essentially is a formalization of apartheid. Mm. I wanted to go to a clip that I'd like you to set up. This you yourself filmed uh, while you were reporting on the West Bank. Um, if you can, it, it is an image of that you're talking to Israeli soldiers who are um, speaking in English to you. Explain where you are, what the circumstances were, why you ended up um, talking to them. So when I got to the West Bank, I first started to try to meet people who had been attacked uh, previously. So I went to the village of Qusra, which um, had just days after October 7th been very violently attacked by settlers in a neighboring outpost. A number of people were killed. And then the following day, there was a funeral. And in the funeral procession, when the bodies were being taken from the hospital to the village, uh, the procession was interrupted by a settler, a blockade of settlers and soldiers, and the settlers shot and killed two more people. So I was interviewing the brother of a man who was killed, and he happened to be busy working in his uh, picking olives just outside the village. So I went there to interview him while he was working. And while we were speaking, we saw soldiers uh, start to approach from the uh, distant outpost. So this is the clip that Shane recorded. These guys are just literally just harvesting all this. And the army is coming in. There are terrorists in all this village. Okay? It's not just in, in, in Gaza. Okay? We we arrest Kamasti. Okay, Kamas? In all this village. But they're just it's harvesting all this. They don't have any weapons. There's no weapons, it's clear. Right? I don't I don't fight with weapons. Yes? No, no, but they don't have weapons. I'm also with no weapons. Uh, well, you have weapons. <laughs> The soldier is putting up his hands, saying, we don't have weapons. But, of course, he's moving the um, uh, automatic weapon on his—that uh, is slung over his shoulder. And he's saying there are terrorists in all of these villages. There's Hamas in all of these villages. Shane. Right. So, one thing that was, was happening while I was there was it was, it was the olive harvesting season. Um, you know, many Palestinians in the West Bank— uh, supplement their income through uh, harvesting olives from orchards that have generally been in their families for generations. And I was on various social media groups by settlers. I was talking to settlers, and they were, they had, were sort of pushing a narrative that olive harvesters were undercover Hamas agents uh, who were trying to attack their settlements. So they were using this as a precedent uh, or as an excuse to sort of uh, forcibly push people out of their groves and prevent the harvest. Of course, this is impacting their lively, livelihood and is, you know, uh, an attempt to sort of encourage people to leave. And there was, there was one village where they actually put flyers on the cars of people who were out at the harvest threatening a new Nakba. You know, the Nakba is sort of the Palestinian word for the expulsion of 750,000 Palestinians in uh, 1948. Um, so, and people had been killed. I reported about a man, Bilal Saleh, who was, who was killed by settlers in his olive grove. 
Um, so, you know, I saw this over and over again, this sort of, um, uh, you know, claim that uh, regular civilian Palestinians were, in fact, Hamas agents, and that uh, in order to protect uh, the settlements, they had to sort of, you know, push, th push them out. And the effect of um, Smotrich, um, you know, Smotrich and Ben Gavir, Israeli settlers, as well as now powerful mm -hmm. members of um, of the Israeli government, uh, cabinet members, the effect of um, the national security minister Ben Gavir announcing that his department uh, was in the process of purchasing 10,000 rifles to equip civilian so-called security teams uh, based around Israel's border and the illegal settlements in the West Bank, giving out these guns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's in addition to 7,000 rifles that were handed to settlers by the army after October 7th. Um, I mean, it's very apparent. You know, Palestinians told me that settlers who had been harassing them before now had M16s. So when I went to settlements, you know, I would go to a just walk into a supermarket and there's people walking around with Uzis and M16s. It's very, very prevalent. Um, and, you know, a part of this, too, is not just the handing out of weapons to civilians, but after October 7th, the army recruited thousands of settlers into the army who then served locally. So someone like Moshe Sharvit, who was just sanctioned by the Biden administration, uh, he had had his outpost uh, since uh, for, for several years and had been documented, uh, you know, dispersing the flocks of local Palestinians, you know, pressuring the Palestinians around his outpost to move away. Then after October 7th, he becomes an, a soldier. And, you know, then he is showing up at the houses of some of these people, uh, threatening to kill them if they don't leave. So uh, 12 families left. And I heard this over and over again from Palestinians that they, you know, especially people who had been directly under pressure from settlers before October 7th, they then just days after October 7th, start seeing the same people in, in military uniform. So, you know, the line between settlers and the army virtually disappeared after October 7th. I wanted to go to a second clip that um, you recorded, Shane, in an interview with an older Palestinian man uh, who said he'd been beaten by Moshe Sharvit, one of the Israeli settlers that the Biden administration has now sanctioned, uh, had been beaten by Moshe and his brother, who showed up to his house, he said, with M-16s in the West Bank. Do you want to set it up a little more, who this man was? Yeah, this man, uh, his name was Nabil Ishteya, and he was one of the people who I met uh, who lived right next to uh, Moshe Sharvit's outpost, Moshe's farm, which is now under sanctions. And he and others kind of described to me what happened after October 7th. You know, again, these people had been harassed for, for years by Moshe uh, before October 7th, but then he describes in this clip uh, what happens. When they came, I was alone. They told me to leave. Then they started beating me. He had four men with him. I spent the night in the hospital in Tobas. Uh, I spent two days in the hospital. Uh, I was injured on my hand, my head, and my back. They beat you with a staff? They beat me with a staff and kicked me. In your house? In the house, I was shouting. I thought they were going to kill me. I managed to get away. I thought they were going to kill me in my house. My neighbors called for an ambulance. They destroyed my water tank. Come this way. They did this the day they drove you out? Yes, that day they beat me. There's the outpost, Musa, uh, Moshi's outpost. So we're looking uh, out into the horizon at Moshe's outpost. Um, again, Moshe um, is one of those that have been sanctioned by the Biden administration. Uh, tell us more about Nabil Ishteya, Shane Bauer. One thing that was not in that clip is that what Nabil told me is that that day uh, soldiers arrived at his house first and uh, said that Moshe had uh, claimed that he was hiding terrorists in his house. So they searched his house, left, and as soon as they left, Moshe and some other guys showed up um, and, and beat him up. And, you know, 
something I want to emphasize uh, is that uh, Moshe, you know, I spoke to, extensively to his wife, Moria, and she she described to me the the different types of support that they are getting from the government for their outposts, again, that is considered even by Israel to be illegal. Um, when they set up the outpost, they were, uh, she said, they had a gazillion meetings with various branches of the government. Um, the uh, army gave them M16s. Uh, they, they set up, uh, the army set up surveillance cameras uh, in the area surrounding the outpost, which the army controls itself. You know, she, Moria said that they were uh, the eyes for the army. Um, and, you know, again, Moshe himself is now a soldier. So, um, when we talk ab about the sanctions that the Biden administration has implemented, you know, the sanctions target Moshe as an individual, they freeze any assets he might have in the United States. But the executive order that, uh, you know, authorizes sanctions, authorizes sanctions also against individuals or uh, officials and government entities who financially or material support uh, these these individuals. So, you know, the the elephant in the room here is that uh, this this man, including along with Nariya Benbazi, um, is supported by the state of Israel directly. Um, so, you know, according to the, the the language of the sanctions, that would mean that the state of Israel itself and all the various organizations that are supporting him uh, should themselves be sanctioned. But of course, they haven't been. Shane, you wrote on X, Israel allocated land to Ben Pazi for an illegal outpost within the area targeted for annexation and paid for guards who violently expelled Palestinians from the surrounding land. Senior IDF officers, including Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, regularly visited his outpost. Tell us more. Yeah, Ben Pazi is interesting himself because he, back in 2015, was uh, you know, he, he established an outpost that was considered by Shin Bet, Israel's internal uh, security branch, uh, to be sort of a center of, of Jewish terrorism. Um, people who lived there had later been convicted for hate, hate crimes, arson-related hate crimes, uh, including the burning to death of a child, a Palestinian child. Benbazi had been arrested and released. And then later, time passed, and uh, Netanyahu um, you might remember, had called for the annexation of a large part of the West Bank. This is during the Trump administration. Um, and at that time, Benbazi's relationship with the government started to change. Uh, the civil administration, which is um, the Israeli occupation sort of bureaucratic arm in the West Bank, allocated land to Benbazi for his illegal outpost. Uh, the Ministry of Agriculture uh, gave him money for these volunteers from an organization called Hashem or Yosh, which uh, is notorious for uh, violently attacking uh, Palestinians. This is an organization that essentially takes uh, delinquent Israeli youth and puts them on these uh, shepherd farms uh, where they, you know, range the sheep and uh, attack Palestinians who enter their turf. If you can talk about who was willing to speak to you and who wasn't. For example, uh, Moria, uh, the wife of Moshe, um, though he wasn't willing to speak to you, explain who she was, born in New Jersey, now a settler in the occupied West Bank. Yeah, I mean, I will say that, you know, getting interviews with settlers is not easy. Uh, many re refuse to, to speak to me as a journalist. Um, Moria, I actually reached out uh, to her because their settlement was, I, I found it on Google Maps and it was designated as a, a tourist site. And it had a website where they offer sort of a B&B &B experience on the website where people can stay in air-conditioned uh, Bedouin tents. You know, ironically, they're displacing these uh, Bedouin from around the area and, you know, uh, so having people sort of stay in these, these uh, glorified versions of it. Um, so I reached out and I, you know, told her I was a journalist and she invited me to come. Um, she herself is from New Jersey. Uh, she moved to... Israel when she was young and grew up in settlements uh, like Moshe did. Um, you know, some of these settlers uh, were, they tended to be very hesitant. And I found that once I, you know, started speaking to them, they, I was surprised at how open they were. You know, once we sat down and talked, I mean, numerous settlers 
uh, compared what is happening now to 1948. Um, you know, the, the head of a regional council, David El Hayani, this is one of the more, uh, these are the governing bodies, sort of, sort of, of settlers in the West Bank. He told me that today, is, the battle today is like the Battle of 1948. It's a fight over land. And he likened these shepherding outposts, Moshi's in particular, to the sort of early settlements, pre-48 settlements of, uh, of Jewish settlers that were sort of setting up settlements in areas, uh, you know, that were sort of largely Arab areas to expand the borders for a future state. He was saying that, you know, what these shepherding outposts are doing is essentially the same thing. They're expanding the territory and taking land. So tell us more about Moria and what she told you. Moria, you know, was very frank about her views uh, about Palestinians. She told me that Palestinians, she did not consider Palestinians to be uh, regular people. Uh, she thought that they should leave, you know, to Jordan, to Syria. Um, and, you know, she told me sort of about their, uh, you know, um, the work of their outposts, you know, and she, the way that she described it is the way a lot of settlers describe it, which is protecting Israel's state land, protecting Area C. Again, you know, this is somebody who believes that the West Bank belongs to her. She believes that the West Bank was given to her by God, um, you know, which, you know, it's important because, again, we have the uh, these sort of religious fundamentalists allied with the secular state of Israel. Um, so she would use these religious arguments, but also these kind of legalistic arguments that Area C was Israel's and that they were defending it. You know, she described what they're doing as protecting, preventing land theft, that Palestinians, by merely living in the West Bank, were stealing land from Israel. You write on X, the Sharvites had a gazillion meetings with government bodies to set up the illegal outposts, Moria said. The farm acted as eyes for the army, she said. The army gave them M-16s, set up surveillance cameras on the surrounding land, which are controlled from a command center, though Sharvit and Benpazi, Israel through Sharvit and Ben Pazi, Israel seizes land while avoiding the legal hurdles of starting official settlements. Avi Naim of the Settlement Ministry said, you take people who believe in that goal as a pioneering mission and let them spearhead the work to keep control of the land. If you could further elaborate on this very close relationship between the Israeli government and the settlers. Yeah, I mean, something to note, like, you know, you read this quote by Avi Naim is, you know, this this is out in the open. You know, this is not a secret. Um, Israeli here, Israeli politicians talking about uh, this type of land seizure that these settlers are doing, um, and you know, the connection is very direct. Uh, Neria Bambazi, for example, who has been sanctioned, he after October seventh, on October twelfth, he coordinated the expulsion of the community of Wadi Sikh. It was a small Palestinian uh, community, and that expulsion happened with dozens of settlers and soldiers together. You know, they came in, they threatened uh, that if people didn't leave, they would be killed. And settlers and so soldiers then tortured uh, a number of Palestinians who were there. Soldiers uh, attacked some Israeli activists who were there in a protective capacity, um, accusing them, you know, saying, why aren't you in Gaza? Why are you protecting terrorists? Um, uh, his Neri Mbazi's lawyer had written in legal documents that he had extensive ties uh, with the security establishment. Um, you know, so this this is this is well established, um, and you know the the sort of, I mean, even in the 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 UN, where I mentioned before, the six hundred or so attacks that have happened since October seventh, the UN said that in at least half of those attacks, soldiers are present. Um, you know, it's not a coincidence. It's not, and it's not merely just soldiers not stopping these settlers. There is an, an active and ongoing uh, collaboration between many of them. And you say these sanctions do not address this. Right. Yeah. I mean, they're they're targeting these individuals. You know, a handful of individuals out of hundreds who are who are attacking Palestinians and sort of, you know, uh, you know, targeting them as individuals, but not the sort of state that is. Uh, supporting them and encouraging them to continue to take land. Journalist Shane Bauer's piece for The New Yorker is headlined, The Israeli Settlers Attacking Their Palestinian Neighbors. And it's breaking news. The Irish prime minister has just resigned. I'm Amy Goodman.